It's been a while since we've done this type of stream, I think. I can remember last week we, we did Invertebrate Dude live stream on StreamYard, and I can't remember any further back than that. But I'm glad to see you all here. I can see 503, J-Man to you, Charlie McLaughlin, Javi Strange Pet, Sean Meister. Let's see. Scrolling down. Random T, Wendy Hickson. Did I miss anybody who's here? I'm not sure. Mr. and Mrs. Morelli is here. Frank the Tank. Steven Sager and the Bug Hub. Insect Central. Excellent. All right. So we have a lot of Patreon questions today. We have a lot of fun stuff to get into. Um, I wanted to open up uh, this enclosure and see if we can see any of the monkey of the Porcelia Expansis as well. But it looks like we have at least seven comments on Patreon. So uh, that's awesome. We'll get into that in just a minute. Um, we're going to dig in here first and see what we can find. I can see some Europods. I don't know if you can see them on the camera. Oh, probably not because now you can see them on the camera. Maybe right there. Look at those Europods. Um, so you can ask questions as well, yes. Um, Patreon questions are coming. Or we're going to be fielding those, but also uh, questions just from the general live stream attendees are welcome as well. Here are a couple of females right there in the center. There's a nice male, and then I think all of those are males. They're just uh, younger males that haven't, whose uh, Europods, the exopodites of the Europods, haven't developed all the way yet. Um, Lacey, welcome. Glad you're catching a live stream. I see Sandy Sizemore's here as well. Mark C. Lemon's here. Excellent. So this is Porcelia Expansis Autumnal Equinox. It's a cultivated morph of the Porcelia Expansis that has kind of a caramely color to it. It's pretty awesome. And Let's see. Oh, there's Wally. Excellent. Oh, wildfire smoke is reaching you. That's, you know, I'm not getting a lot where I am. It must be further south than me where the, where the wildfire is. And Random T, congrats on the Sea Marina. Excellent. So Charlie McLaughlin, in this species, it's really easy to tell the difference between male and female, even when they're fairly young. See, these, this is a female. These are two females right here. They're Europods. The exopodites of their uropods uh, are, you can see them extending from the end of their uh, pleon or their tail area, but the, uh, they're not nearly as long as they are in a male, and the, the body is a little wider in proportion to uh, its body length. I'm trying to work on focus here, I'm having a little trouble with that. You can see they, the uropods are a lot longer proportionally, and in uh, just absolutely longer as well. So, hopefully that helps. Uh, it's pretty easy with this species. The males also have little ridges on their head, which is a little hard to see here, but uh, there's, there's some more here. So, you can see the dimorphism here. Two very obvious males here. One has even longer ear pods than the other. And people call these Europods, and they're not wrong, but the, they have actually four Europods. Two of them are really tiny, and you don't see much of them in most terrestrial isopods. And they're, they're in the middle of the other ones and part way under the body. You can kind of see them if you get close up in some species. Like, you can see them a little bit in here. Those are the endopodites, and these are the exopodites, or the big long ones that you see. But they're all Europods. It's just, if you want to be real specific, you call them uh, exopodites or exopodites, or however you want to pronounce it. Um, so, oh, we got a super chat. Super chat from Insect Central. Excellent, and thank you so much. Really appreciate that. So, going through the chat here. Um, Wendy, congratulations on your flower beetles coming today. Hope that goes well. And... Mantis God, congratulations on the ivory babies. That's great. 
Love those. <laughs> okay, let's see. Let's see if we can and drum up some little monkey here. See a bunch of, uh, I'm not sure if, let's see. I found one under here the other day. There's one. It's not really a manka anymore. It's already shed once. When they molt once, um, they're no longer monkai, and they often molt within a few hours of birth. So, not technically a manka anymore. It is, an, it is a, a juvenile. We can call it a juvenile, but that is a juvenile of the Porcelio expansus, along with the loads of springtails, as one would hope to see. Oh, there's Cassie. Excellent. And I, I saw that you posted a question. I see another uh, juvenile right there. I'm not going to mess with it since it's on the moss, but that little speck is another manka. And I'm not going to dig around too much in the substrate because they're kind of sensitive. But confirmed, they're still alive, doing well. The little baby ones. So I'm excited for that. The baby Porcello expansus autumnal equinox. And Lacey B, excellent. You got some magic potions. We'll take a look at my magic potions in a minute if you want to. Vicky White, you got some dairy cows. Excellent. I'm glad my, my YouTube helped bring you to dairy cows. I love dairy cows. And Insect Central, Bolivari are awesome. But I can't speak from personal experience because I don't have that species. I think that's the sole species on my list of approved isopods that I have a permit to keep or to have shipped to me, I should say, that uh, I don't have. Um, working on my bug shelf here, I'm just going to detach for a second so I can get some other isopods out here. Just a second. I like to call this shelf my micro zoo. And there's a lot more stuff going on. Let's see. So magic potions. Let's take a look at my... I have three lines of magic potion because there's really one true line of magic potions. Uh, this is my enclosure with my American line of magic potions, which are the true magic potions. Um, the reason why I say that they're true is because Kyle Candillion, uh, they based on stock he got from Jay Fiore, uh, used, he did some line breeding to get an intensified uh, yellow marking, uh, kind of a trait going on. He did a lot of line breeding to get this intensified yellow marking going on with stock that Jay Fiore sent him. And that is why they have the name. Look at that yellow. I mean, it's, it's pretty crazy on a lot of these specimens here. And that is due to Kyle's work and he named the magic potion after that. Then some other pied stock was uh, isolated from a Japanese source and the line breeding going on to produce the yellow coloration did not occur, but they were still called magic potions, which probably, you know, confuses people. So anyway, um, I love both of them. They're awesome, but these have a lot more intense yellow in most cases than the um, Japanese line do. My culture came in part from Cassie. I saw her in the uh, saw her in the chat a minute ago, and from Critters and More, Braden at, at Critters and More. So Cassie from the Bugs and Braden from Critters and More sent me some stock, and they have been producing well, doing well. You can see all the juveniles in here were born here, all, uh, and the the bigger adults came from from them. So I've got mm, multiple broods of young. Uh, and they're doing really well. So, let's see. Yeah, and yes, some people were asking whether I'm in the UK or the US. Uh, I am in the US, indeed. Oh, Vicabulous is here too, or Vico Bubbles, as uh, Josh calls him. And Theropod Hunter, congrats on the Acellus Aquaticus. And Sandy, hopefully you do get a lot of yellow on yours. There are a few other lines of the magic potions that are not the true magic potions. One of them, though, the next one I'm going to show you, because I've got three lines of what are often titled magic potions. These are probably descended from the true magic potions. With just an extra mutation added in. That's my understanding. Partly because... 
I've heard it said and passed around, and, but partly because they've got an awful lot of yellow on them if they're not descended from that same stock. I would be surprised to see this much yellow on the stock. So these are um, Porcel Porcelio. These are Armadillidium vulgare, um, orange Dalmatians or orange Dalmatian magic potions because their dark spots are often sort of a rusty color. So that's what we've got here. So these are probably just magic potions, American line that uh, mutated again to have the orange going on. So I just saw a super chat. I don't want to miss it. Oh, Mr. and Mrs. Marilia, there it is. Thank you so much. Do you breed banded crickets? Ours bred once. The second set of adults look to be depositing eggs in soil, but no young yet. What could be the issue? Okay, tell me a little bit about your setup. I do breed banded crickets. have bred them a lot. You can probably hear a banded cricket or two in the background. What I did, I probably bred banded crickets. Oh, here's a whole bunch of these orange Dalmatian magic potions. Bred uh, banded crickets probably two or three years. And then I took a hiatus from breeding them and then realized, nope, Buying crickets is too much of a pain. Banded crickets don't smell like the other ones and they're easier to breed. I'm gonna go back to breeding the banded crickets. So that's what I did. And I just recently restarted. So really recently restarted. So I'm back with, uh, I just got my, my first adult generation is still here and I've got lots of babies now. But I have bred generation after generation of them in the past and I will say, uh, let's think about temperature and humidity and so on and uh, what I do is I put a, a heat uh, what's the ultra therm heat pad up against the side of the enclosure and it keeps one side really warm and so the crickets can thermoregulate and they tend to lay a lot of eggs near that side make sure that the soil is kept moist and whatnot and then they just produce like crazy that's what I'm doing now before I did my setup more like I do uh, house crickets with little containers that are I put a heat pad under the tank and then put the containers of cocoa peat or whatever inside that and let them lay their eggs in there and then um, let them hatch out that way. So you can do either one with banded crickets, but banded crickets are more like roaches and that you can keep them with a bioactive substrate. I have springtails in there and everything with them now and they seem to be doing well. So tell me a little bit more about your setup and we'll see what we can come up with. And thanks again for the super chat. Oh, Kevin say you got a brown, brown snake, decays brown snake. That is awesome. Oh, Wendy, you got white huntsmans? Those are so cool. Insect Central. I know a little about lubber grasshoppers. I've never bred them, but I'm interested in doing it. If I had more space, I would probably do it. Okay, so Mr. and Mrs. Merrill, you have vermiculite base, cup of organic soil, lid with holes for females to deposit eggs. Room is 7882. Okay. Um, that sounds ideal to me. How long has it been? What's the interval been for you? between egg uh, laying and uh, the beginning of egg laying and, and hatching. So Lacey B, specific tips for keeping magic potions. Um, well, magic potions are pretty much your, uh, your basic eye spot in terms of husbandry. There's nothing fancy about caring for them, just the basic uh, stuff. But I would say make sure there's lots of leaf litter, lots of hides, and of course, I like to give mine a ton of um, Supreme Isopod Chow. They do really well on that, along with the leaf litter. And they, they'll grow fast on it compared to some other foods in my experience. So um, if you can give them that, that would be a good thing. And they, they do love moss. I think somebody said that. 503, mossy sticks. Yeah. Armadillidium vulgari loves moss. Most armadillidium really love it. Okay, I probably missed some of the chat, but... Well, um, Mr. and Mrs. Merlia, it's been a little uh, early on in my experiment with the bioactive uh, banded crickets to say I can unreservedly um, recommend it, but it seems to be working well so far. And I know that uh, Kyle Candelli at Roach Crossing does it with his, and they seem to be doing pretty well. Um, if your soil is getting too dry, that will totally kill them. So um, they are a more tropical cricket than the house cricket. And I feel like they like a little more humidity in their soil and that's good for their eggs. So um, 
I would say that that's definitely worth checking out. I've been very careful to make sure that I have uh, portions of my substrate that don't dry out at all. And I'm sure if it got too dry, it would be an issue. So you may be getting tons of eggs and they're just not all hatching because they're not getting uh, quite moist enough. You don't want to soak them, of course, but you, you definitely don't want them drying out. That could be it. And somebody just asked me, who was it? Jeff asked me if I would keep any chelonians. Turtles, tortoises, that sort of thing. I totally would. I totally would. I don't have any space for it right now. Most chelonians require quite a bit of space. But if I had the space, would I do it? Yes, absolutely. Space and time, I should say, because I need some of both uh, to do that. But I would. Um, and all the other things that I need to take care of them. Many of them need UVB. Probably all of them benefit from it and a uh, considerable amount of space and they're fairly specialized in their dietary needs compared to some reptiles, like compared to a snake, which you can do fine on a rodent diet in many cases. They need a very varied diet and many of them are herbivorous, some of them are omnivorous. You have to, the herbivorous ones often need things like grasses and hay to do well, some of the herbivorous tortoises and stuff, so it can be a lot of work. I do have rubber ducky ice pods. We can probably take a look at some of them, Brandon, in a little while. Why not? And Hobby Strange Pets. Awesome. I saw a garden snail today, three of them actually, on my way to the train. These are my uh, Japanese magic potions. I've had this culture for a lot longer than I've had the others. But notice, while some of them have a decent amount of yellow, the average amount of yellow is lower on these than in the others. And I feel like it might possibly be less bright. But there are loads of them in here, and they're gorgeous anyway, even though they're not the same as the American Magic Potions, and probably need a different name. It's probably too late for that. But they're awesome. I mean, how could they not be? They're isopods, right? Let's see. Corey Hendricks, what would you recommend as a cleanup crew for 75% to 100% humidity? Depends on your macro fauna, Corey. Let me know um, what else you're keeping in there, and I'll give you some recommendations. Uh, if it's an invertebrate, you know, or it's, it's a sensitive amphibian, or if it's a large reptile, that'll help me get some ideas to you. Oh, Lacey J, excellent. Yep, we got a Lacey J and a Lacey B, and fortunately, since your candle 4444, it's even easier to differentiate the two. So anyway, there is my, uh, those are my three so-called magic potions doing really well. This is the culture that I've had the longest and uh, the Japanese ones and they're doing great. Let's see. So I just saw a question about, someone was asking me about granulatum. I don't actually have granulatum right now or P. bolivari. So I don't actually have either one of those. And young smoke pole. Well, you're welcome. I'm glad that it's helping you. And you got some excellent species there, Expansus and Magnificus. So Stephen Sager, I'm concerned there isn't a sufficient moisture gradient in my green and oil substrate for powder oranges, but you mentioned it should be fine. Can you say more about powder orange moisture grade? Yeah, powder orange are pretty bulletproof. Some people keep them without much of a moisture gradient very successfully. I have found that they, they like one. I prefer to give them one, but then I prefer to give almost all my isopods a moisture gradient. But I would say that uh, they are one of the ones who can do well without it as long as they have enough ventilation. If you cut down on the ventilation too much, they're not going to like it. But I think they're going to be a great one for your anoles, honestly. Because, um, or anoles, depending on how you want to pronounce it. I feel like they will be okay in a setup like that because in an anole enclosure, you're going to need a decent amount of ventilation anyway, so I think you'll be fine. It's just going to take a little while to set them up. If you put one uh, starter culture in with an, in an anole enclosure, it's going to take a few months before you see a whole lot going on unless, you know, there's a large number of the isopods to start with. So I think that's all that's going on. And... Corey, I don't know if I've seen what you've got in your setup. Maybe I missed it, but I would say dwarf whites are usually great in high humidity enclosure. Florida fast are also good high humidity enclosures. Um, Silisticus convexus can do really well in there. If there's 
decent ventilation. You can do well with uh, powders, very well with powders in there. And uh, Porcelio Dilatatus does really well in something like that. So there's some options. So. Catching up here. So Jeff, common musk turtles. I've actually been really interested in the musk mud and stink pot turtles, that whole group, just because they seem to be really easy. And if I were going to get a Chelonian, it'd probably either be that, or if I had the money, black-breasted leaf turtles. So Sandy, Japanese or American, which one is more rare? I don't know. Good question. I think... Uh, I don't know if there's one that's actually more rare in the hobby or not. I feel like American, if I could only pick one, it'd be the American ones just because they are brighter in color and they can get bigger. They tend to get larger as well as having that, that higher yellow coloration. Okay. Ooh, sorry. I'm going to put these last American, uh, put these, I mean the Japanese American, <laughs> Japanese, what am I saying? I am so confused. Um, the, I'm going to put the Japanese magic potions away. And sorry for the bumps. The space here is limited. Um, going to look at the Punta Canas for a minute. Got loads of those going on. And let's see. Go right to American alligator rather than turtles and tortoises, Kevin. <laughs> My wife actually loves alligators. And if we had a facility sufficient for it, she'd probably be up for it. I'd have to move because they're illegal in my state, at least without a permit. Maybe with a permit I could do it. Here's some Takanas. Love these guys. Uh, okay, just checking. Here, I feel like I missed some stuff, but Therapod Hunter, have you kept triops before? I certainly have multiple generations of them. I would um, dry out eggs and re, you know, hatch, rehydrate and hatch them again and again and again from the same stock. So yeah, I've had many, many, many triops many, many times. They're very cool. And Frank. So Mantis God, you're looking for some velvet ants. Um, depending on where you are in the country, it might be a little early for them. They tend to show up in the summer and uh, fall more. So Lacey's Night Golds, those are the, the stock that I collected and, and worked on refining. Went through a boom. Monkey everywhere. That's awesome. That is so cool. Hopefully they do really well for you. Sounds like they already are, but hopefully you get some cool ones out of those uh, tiny little monkey. I don't have any tarantulas though. Yeah, Lacey, uh, I agree. They are gorgeous. They are really, really fun isopods. Oh, said sunbeam snake for the, for the snake. Yeah, um, you probably do want something either dwarf whites or Atlantosha floridana, something that moist. That's that's what I would do. Those two species will do well for you in really high humidity, and um, not not necessarily and and a lot of moisture because moisture and humidity are not always exactly the same thing. You know, they're not the same thing. They they often accompany one another, but they're not the same parameter. Let's put it that way. You can have high humidity and have somewhat dry substrate if you do it right. And you can decrease the humidity by uh, through ventilation and airflow and whatnot. So I'll be right back.
Oh, Mentis God, you've got a nice beetle community going on there. And Sean Meister, that is correct. My wife will not allow tarantulas. Oh yeah, Mentis God, if you're in California, you might encounter some velvet ants this time of year. Much of California is mild enough for that to be a thing. Here's one of my favorite isopods and definitely my favorite armadillidium. Hands down, this species beats them all for me. They get big, they're beautiful, they breed well but not super, super fast. And they're out and about all the time, as you saw. The only reason they're not, they're a little scared right now is because I just opened the lid, but before I did they were all out waiting for food and whatnot. So. Oh, so Kevin, yeah. The uh, alligators being legal in Michigan. Yeah, here, not a thing. Although, I do know of someone who has one with a permit. Because they have a basically a, a little zoo. Um, so maybe with a permit, but that's the only way you can get them. Oh, Heather Jensen's here. Excellent. What's the most interactive species of isopod in your opinion? Like one that allows you to hold and hand feed them? I think uh, probably either Porcelia lavis or Porcelia ornatus yellow dot. Two of the ones that will totally allow you to, they'll totally take food out of your hands. They're not the only ones, but they tend to be really kind of aggressive about it. Um, I would say two pets are my life. And Kendall, also known as Lacey. Um, how are my zingers doing? They're producing babies. I've got babies. I posted on Instagram a little video of some of the babies in there. They are awesome. I love the zingers. And it's funny because I'm really not a guy who likes azanthic things. Azanthic, for those of you who might not know, um, things that lack, uh, you know, if, if something's completely azanthic, it'll lack a number of pigments among those pigments, things like yellows and oranges and stuff, typically. And uh, colors like that, and it was... When I heard that they existed, I thought, oh, that sounds kind of cool, but I, I can you improve on wild-type gestroy? And then I saw some. Um, it was uh, Brandy at Ractastic Rax. I saw some of hers, I think it was, and I just thought, wow, those are actually kind of fantastic. And she offered to send me some, and they're even more fantastic in person. They are gorgeous. They're like giant spotted zebras, kind of, and just really bold coloration and everything, so I love them. I so love them. And Young Smoke Pole. I have the uh, Oniscus acellus BC maple, and I also have normal, and I also have the Mardi Gras Dalmatian of that species, and they are cool. They're, they're very cool. I really like them a lot. They're an underrated isopod for sure. Okay, Heather Jensen, I have a possible suggestion for you if you've got high humidity but also good ventilation in that five gallon glass jar. Um, Bonones or uh, Sesei, the, uh, the Opilione, the Harvestman. I think that would be really cool in there. Yeah, Kevin, I see what you're saying. Anything that uh, is not that hard to get and is expensive, doesn't matter how hard it is to care for as an adult, people are going to buy it. So, and have some weird plan in their heads like, oh yeah, I'll get a new home when it gets to be two feet long and I can't keep it in this uh, kiddie pool anymore or whatever, you know? So yeah, I totally see what you're saying. And Lacey B, I bet your gestures are gonna come out more just like mine eventually. They just, it's, just a, it's a numbers game. What is going on there? One's dragging another one, is that a body? Uh-oh. Oh, I got a super chat from Richard at Tarantula Collective. Well, thank you, Richard. I really appreciate it. I'm glad you love the content, and I really appreciate your support. And I'll try to keep it up. Richard is, is one of those who's always been a great supporter of the channel. really appreciate that. So, thank you, Tarantula Collective.
So pets are my life. Do very low temperatures cause stunted growth and ice spots? I don't know how much research has been done on that. That's a good question. It may depend on species, may depend on other factors as well. I think it'd have to be really cold to bug some of them like, uh, like dairy cows, but when your room got really cold, how cold did it get? I, I would be kind of surprised. I feel like isopods can, well, not all isopods, but many, many isopods can handle really pretty low, crazy low temperatures. Dwarf whites are one that can't. Some of the tropical cubaris probably didn't, wouldn't do well in lower temperatures, but... Uh, Okay, so Heather, you're making a teeny stone grotto water feature with a marble sculpture and waterfall. Could be interesting with a spider instead of a, a harvestman. Yeah, could be. How are the tailless whip scorpions? You know, I just did a feeding, filmed a feeding video of my tailless whip scorpion. I only have one now. Uh, but I did do a feeding video of her today that I will be releasing sometime. Hopefully, if it turned out okay. I, mean, I think I got some good footage there, so... Um, she's doing pretty well. Yeah, and Lacey B, I think that's what we're getting. I think there was a, a dead one in there, and they were dragging it off to eat it. I noticed they just had a ton of babies in this enclosure recently, so I split it uh, out into another enclosure. So now I've got a bunch of Jestroy babies, adults, and whatnot in a, a 16 quart, in addition to this little display enclosure. So reptilian exotic, get rid, getting rid of grain mites. There's a lot to, that goes on there. One is making sure you have a robust springtail population. One, making sure you don't have a lot of um, excess food in the enclosure. You can work with things like uh, rove beetles or predatory mites, not to be confused with parasitic mites, that will also uh, take care of mites like that. So those are some, some ways you can deal with it. Oh, we've got a super chat from Dan. And another super chat from Mr. and Mrs. Morelia. And hopefully I didn't miss another one. Uh, so, Javi Strange Pets sent one. And I'm not sure what he's talking about with the Tarantula app. But Dan sent one. Caught another live stream. Pioronatus monkey are everywhere in my new colony. Excellent. Which strain of Pioronatus are you working with? And then here we go with Mr. and Mrs. Morelia. Any news on a room tour? Maybe in parts of everything all at once, but it would be too big of a project. Yeah, I've been thinking about that, and I've just been so pressed for time. I want to do, at the very least, an all-isopod tour, and hopefully a more of a room tour, but it definitely is going to be in parts. I'm thinking just the isopod part itself, I'd need to do at least three parts, probably an armadillidium, a porcelio, and everything else. Um, but, yeah, I want to do it. I want to do it. It's just going to be going to take a while. I'm actually going to have some time. My wife's going on a trip uh, for a couple of days to a conference. And I'm wondering, maybe I could fit something in there. And that's coming up next month. So maybe I'll make some progress. I see a super chat from Young Smoke Pole. Excellent. Thank you so much. It says, uh, let's see. Wow, can I see those OSLS BC Maple and those other colored OSLS? Would you be willing to ship to Canada? I love what you do. Well, thank you. I wish I could ship to Canada. I can't do that. But I can show them to you, sure. I'll get these just right out of the way. These hungry little critters. I love them. Okay. Well, pets are my life. 20 degrees overnight? Yeah, you could definitely do some damage with that. So I, I don't know if that will stunt them or not, but it may have. Oh yeah, Mantis God, using the cricket cubes to fish out the uh, the mites help reduce the numbers. That's a good one. Another one is uh, potato chunks. I know what you're saying, 503, about you just want to bring everything home. I saw the three um, garden snails today at the train station. I was like, oh, shoot, I don't have any containers I can put them in. So guess what I did? The day after I got home from work, I put a container in my bag. So the next time I see some, I can bring some home. So Therapod Hunter, I've cultured bloodworms a little. I haven't cultured glassworms at all. And 
So I'm not sure if I can give you a lot of information on glassworms. Be right back. Okay, we had a request for rubber duckies. I've got the rubber duckies here on the table. We had a request for an Oniscus ocellus. So I got a couple of my Oniscus ocellus here. Oh, okay, Pyronotus high yellow. Oh, yes, I remember, Dan, when you mentioned that they gave birth in the mail. I think another did after unpacking. Two sizes and a lot. That's awesome. Because they tend to be kind of seasonal breeders. So the fact that you got so many so quick after purchasing them is pretty awesome. Okay, this is a new culture. I don't know if there are any babies in here yet. But I do have some adults of the Mardi Gras Dalmatians. They are an awesome species. I feel like they're a little bit overexposed there. Look how gorgeous those are. Wouldn't you just look at those little flecks. They look like little flecks of mica or gold or something on there. Isn't that cool? This is the uh, Mardi Gras Dalmatian. There's another one right there down the substrate. And there's another one here. I don't know if you can see it right there. Oh, it's off, off camera. Look. I don't know if there are babies in here yet, like I said. But I'm just going to poke around a little. See if I see any. Because, like I said, this is a fairly new culture. So there may not be any babies in here yet. But... They seem to be doing well, and they're great. They're gorgeous. And they are definitely more stunning in person. No about that. Now, let me see if we can see the oranges, the maples. They are so cool. These are the, oh, there's some. They're kind of like the witch's brew, yeah, a little bit. Um, the witch's brew or not us. By the way, my witch's brew or not us had babies too. Here's some oranges. Also very gorgeous. I think these are the one, of the one of the best expressions of orange in any isopod, to be honest. They are gorgeous. And yes, Justin. Justin Dukes. Guilford, those are spring tails. Okay, so, um, so pets are my life. Yeah, it just may be something going on like that. It may be a stunting event. Hard to say for sure, but that may be what it is. So, Alan Tooth, just a minute ago, um, you probably missed it, but I was showing you some Armadillidium gestroy. If you keep a lot of isopods in a clear container, I actually did a video on this recently. It's called like Six Great. Um, display isopods or something like that. Keep them in a clear container like an acrylic or a glass aquarium or something. There are species that will just be on display all the time. So Armadillidium gestroy, just scroll back a little bit in the chat once this is over, or not in the chat, in the watch the video or, or watch my video on Armadillidium gestroy. They're a great example of an isopod that can be a display isopod. And that other video I mentioned of the six great display isopods mentions quite a few others that can make great display They're out and about. And also, of course, as I mentioned in that video, a number, it's a numbers game. Depending on how many you have, um, you, can, you can have so many uh, isopods in one enclosure that they're all out and about all the time. And I have several species that actually absolutely excel at that, and some that aren't as good at that. But you can absolutely have them as display animals. So there are some species I wouldn't recommend for that. Here's one that is not a terribly good display animal until you have a lot of them. Once you have a lot of them, it's a different story, but let's take a look. Um, okay, so Diane, do you think of getting any more dart frogs? Um, I might do that at some point. I don't have any immediate plans to do so. These are uh, the rubber duckies, and they are not uh, out on display all that much until you have a lot of them. Once you have a lot of them, they'll be everywhere. But mine, I probably have a hundred in this enclosure or more, and I don't see them a lot. At night, I do. You see they're, they're out and about here. But at night they're everywhere, but 
in the daytime, they're, they're all hiding. That's kind of fun, though. Look at all those crowded in there under that piece. One problem with this limestone that I don't like is that you have to put it back so carefully not to crush anybody. You can easily crush your isopods. So, yep, you can see. Let's see, do ice pods lay eggs or give live birth? Well, they lay eggs into a pouch under their belly and they keep the babies in the pouch until they're, they hatch and then they release them. So it's sort of in between. And Kim, I do have a video on how to culture fruit flies. Yeah, it's old, but it's still pretty valid. Um, I've changed some things the way I do them, but the way the things I do in the video, they all work. So how are all my non-inverts doing? Good question, Heather. Uh, I've got a garter snake that's immensely pregnant, if you guys want to see her. Um, so Lacey, I'm missing the comment about the, the orange kluge eye, which I would love to see. Oh, maybe you're talking about the orange, uh, orange aniscus acellus. I got to see the orange kluge eye. I want to. So. Thriving colony of BC maples, young smoke pole. Thank you. I got those from, uh, Scott at Finger Lakes Feeders. That is... He's the guy, um, one of the specialists in Oniscus ocellus in the country. He's got some really interesting uh, morphs going on of that species. Really interesting stuff. So um, you should contact him. I do have a young culture of Cubaris panda kings, Lacey B. Okay, so I'm seeing I'm getting some super chats I don't want to miss. Um, this is my my lady here. Uh, this is Ruby. She's very pregnant. You can see her scale spread uh, right now. There's like space between her scales. That she, that's just there's just bare skin there showing, like right there. You can get a really good look at her scale spread because she's very very pregnant. Um, Okay, so trying to catch up. Am I missing super chats? Mods, if I'm missing super chats, let me know. Does that limestone have a specific name from Dope Critters? Um, where could I get some? Um, I can't remember the name right now, but if you will email me Dope Critters, I will, I'll guarantee I'll look it up for you. I got it on Amazon, and I can send you a link to it. Um, let's see. Therapod Hunter, my thank you for the super chat, dope critters, and and Therapod Hunter, my latest cleanup crew ice pods are ag, Agabiformis lentis. I read they are a large, like a larger dwarf white, but less specific and irritating. Well, it sounds like a pretty good, pretty good deal then. And our aquatic universe, thank you. I'm glad you appreciated the the topics. Yeah, we're getting some great super chats, everyone. I really appreciate it. Oh, yes, Lacey, you're right. I showed you a picture of the orange clue guy. What I meant was I haven't seen them in person. Um, I have not seen them in person, and I really want to because um, I feel like every time you see an ice pod in person, it's a totally different experience. Like those oranges I just showed you and the uh, Oniscus acellus, they uh, are not nearly as cool on screen as they are in, in real life. And 503, great point. I got some of my first limestone that way. Just going to a store, I think they made me, you know, I paid like five bucks for a few chunks of limestone, and it was a pretty good deal. But you can sometimes get them for free. And yes, she's both beautiful and going to pop. <laughs> she refused food at the last feeding on Sunday, and she shed about a week and a half ago or something. Maybe I'm wrong on that. Fairly recently. So I think she's really close. And any guesses on the number of 
baby she's going to have. She had 22 last year. 21 were living and healthy. Uh, tw the 22nd was stillborn. And Wendy Hickson, thank you for the sticker. Really appreciate that. And those of you who are interested in babies, I have a waiting list with about 10 people on it. Holy cow, I can feel the babies underneath her skin. When she runs across me, I can feel little bumps. That's crazy. Um... So do I know her lineage? I know that um, her parents were from Don's Garter Snakes, and he got them from a guy who collected the originals in uh, Montana, I think. So I don't know much beyond that, but she was captive, born and bred, I'm not sure if her parents, I believe her parents were captive born, but I'm not sure if the grandparents were. So pets are my life. If you're up at night, then rubber duckies would be pretty good. And of course, like I said, once you get rubber duckies, you have lots and lots of them. You will see more of them. So Stephen, pricing on the babies. The babies are $50 and then they're shipping, which varies depending on where you are in the country. Uh, the last time I shipped them out to ship to Idaho, which is not far from me, it was around $35, $38, something like that. And to ship to the East Coast, I think the furthest away I shipped was Massachusetts, and it was around 100 for the shipping. But generally, you want to get more than one anyway, so it's not as bad when you think of it. You're getting two shipped or three shipped. It's not as bad. And they are gorgeous snakes. Some people get confused and they think these are the California red sided. They're not. They're the this is a Montana locality of a different subspecies, but they still live up to their name. And they do have some interesting red markings. She's not my most red marked individual. But their scale spread it shows up a little bit more than it would otherwise too. But uh, the males um, the males it's not just like the males normally show up, but I have one male that shows up more just because he happens to, not because he's male, to clarify there. <laughs> 503, change to $1,000 a piece so you're not tempted. Well, um, Hobby Strange Pets, as soon as you get to be 13, and um, you said your, your parents' permission is not an issue, so as soon as you get to 13, we can... We can set something up. And Kim, I have been breeding garters every year. I have a few. I'm going to be doing that uh, most years. It may not always be the same pair. I might give uh, you know particular pairs a rest, but I, I think I'm going to do that. Right now I have two pairs of, well, I have one trio and two pairs. And the trio is a reverse trio, two males and one female. So I only have this female of the uh, Montana Red Side. It's... So maybe next year, Kim, you can always uh, check with me. You can always get on the waiting list once this waiting list is, you know, done and I've sent all the babies out. You can get on my waiting list for that year. And you never have to, you know, don't have to commit 100% to getting one. What happens when you get on the waiting list is once the babies are, are ready to go or almost ready to go, I send you a message and say, hey, uh, you're on the waiting list as you, you know, you're on the waiting list. So I'm contacting you. I've got babies. And they're eating and they're, they're getting ready to go out. Do you still want one? I, well, usually more than one. Because I do recommend they go out in twos and threes and whatnot. Um, but some people get one and that can work too. Especially if they already have some they're going to put them with. But anyway, um, so I check with you and say, do you still want to be? Uh, do you still want some this year? And then if you do, then we'll, we'll keep going. If not, no, no worries. No problem. Hey, refrigerator. Welcome. So... Lacey, Kendall 4444, um, how old is Ruby? I want to say she's she's going to be four in August. She was born in August, and I think she's going to be four. And last year was the first year I bred her. So, yeah, she, I think she's over three years old now, almost four. And, yeah, last year was the first litter. First year at all, they were way too young to breed. Second year... Um, it was, eh, maybe this will work. 
but they didn't do anything and then the third year is when they produced that i think that makes sense i could be wrong on that but that's that's my recollection Oh, Kevin Zay, I'm really excited about that species. Thamnophis cosinus, the Oregon red spotted garter. They're gorgeous. They're every bit as gorgeous as the California red sided. And for some reason, not as uh, popular, but I don't know why. I think they're a little harder to breed, though, right? That's what I've heard. Let's see what we've got. Yeah, it's good to wait till age two. You don't want to breed them in their first year. That's so that's smart. So heavy strange pet. The first snake I got, not including, you know, short term garter snakes I had as a kid, uh, was our corn snake, which we still have, and we've had him about four years, I think. Uh oh, just one second. Got. I was a genius and I left the uh, garter snake enclosure open when I took Ruby out and the boys were starting to take trips. So just had to close the door. So, Victor, downsizing your furniture to make room for your colonies of animals. I did that when I was a kid. Took my bed out of my room, slept on the floor for years. So, and I took my closet doors off and made tables out of them so I could put more creatures on them. My brother was okay with it. At least he pretended to be. <laughs> he was pretty tolerant. Yeah. They do, they're super curious. It's funny. Garters are so curious. When it's feeding time, they will climb up out, out me, climb up out of the enclosure onto me, even when they don't want food. Like on Sunday, it was time for Ruby to eat. She was not at all interested in food, totally refused food multiple times, but she totally wanted to crawl out and, and say hi. So, um, Javi Strange Pets. How big hatchling garters? They're not, uh, it depends on the size of the garter and the species of garter and lots of different things. This particular species tends to go in terms of quantity, produces a lot of babies for the size, and they tend to be tiny, like a mechanical pencil size, super tiny. Um, maybe even thinner than that. They're probably thinner than that. Uh, and some garter species tend to have more babies, but they're bigger. So it depends on what you're working with. So I need to put this lady away and I'm going to start answering Patreon questions because I haven't answered any yet and I want to make sure I get there. So thank you patrons for sending in your questions. I'm going to put something more interesting there than the nothing you can see right now so that uh, it doesn't get visually boring there. Maybe we can take a look at these high contrast. Uh, these are high contrast Punta Canas. These come from Medieval Serpents, also known as Under a Mossy Log on uh, Instagram. They're pretty cool. I really like them. Uh, there's, there's more color variation in these as I look at Patreon and give you some answers. Okay, so. Here we go. Questions. Cassie has a question. Says, help. Somehow I found red wrigglers on the damp side of some of my enclosures. I tried to take them out as I see them, but being in multiple bins, it worries me. Hmm. Well, the most important thing might be to figure out where they're coming from, how they got in there. Uh, because they're a little bit difficult to remove without replacing all the substrate because, as I'm sure you know, um, 
worms are pairing hermaphrodites in that they, they require a mate, but once they have a mate, so they're not parthenogenic, but once they have a mate, it doesn't matter. Both are males and females. Each worm is a male and a female, and can, they can fertilize each other, and then they'll both lay fertile eggs. And the egg capsules are a little bit hard to separate from the substrate. Not that it can't be done, but it's difficult. And so you could get one egg capsule to hatch, and then they're back. So there is that issue, but we, we probably need to determine what's going on there, um, how they're getting in there, what they're coming in on, and then you probably will need to start new substrate and just move the isopods onto some new seasoned substrate if you really want to get rid of them. Another question is, do you want to? They don't necessarily cause huge problems. They do tend to eat the same things the isopods do and exhaust the substrate to some extent more quickly than isopods would alone. But at the same time, the isopods will eat their castings and their castings are more nutritious than the soil they just ate. So for a limited time, it'll, it'll balance out a little bit because yes, they're eating the substrate, but they're also producing nutritious earthworm castings for the isopods to eat. But it will get to a point when there's not much nutrition in the soil and it will happen faster because they're there. So not a huge deal except for that. But uh, I hope that helps. And Sandy Sizemore recently got some Expansis Monk as well. Excellent. Awesome. Congrats on that. Not really a question, but a super awesome comment. Let's see. And Nitro 1926 says, Hi, Expansis are the only species I'm struggling with. I've lost 50% of them, but the new bin seems to be more appropriate. They seem to be not hungry. They really eat little of supplemental food. I've also noticed that they like more high humidity than a lot of airflow. Congratulations for your offspring. Well, I've found that mine, in, in terms of supplemental food, mine eat um, two things, really, supplemental food-wise. One is supreme isopod chow, and one is fish food pellets. Those are the two foods that they eat in terms of supplemental foods that I've noticed much uh, you know, feeding response for those two things. And that's really about it. And I'm sure there are others, but that's what mine have been working on more than anything else. Um, I've also say, you say they notice they like more high humidity than they like airflow. I'd say that they, they kind of like both. If they can get high humidity and a decent amount of airflow, I think you're kind of golden with those. They still need a gradient, but if they can have a decent high humidity and airflow, they seem to do really well. So hopefully yours will improve. I also noticed that I do have some issues with them. A lot of times I'll get big adults start to do their thing. They've reproduced a couple of times because they will reproduce at a fairly small size. They'll reproduce and then die off. So that they've never died off for me, but I have times when I don't have any big adults. So I'm still working on it. I moved mine into a much larger bin. They're in a, what is it, a 26 quart tub, 28 quart tub, something like that, to try to get... Uh, you know, give them lots of space and hiding places, and I hope that's going to help. And Sandy has a question. Is there a method to the madness of knowing which species need protein? Do they all need protein or just some? Which, besides dairies, need more? There is a lot of conversation about that, even, dare I say, controversy about that. Look at these. These are almost like gym mix. They're so cool. Love these Punta Canas. Um, there's a lot of controversy about that about which species are protein hungry and which species are actually looking for moisture, or which species can get along just fine without large amounts of protein and breed and produce very well, even though they crave and will have a high feeding response, um, they, they don't necessarily need all that protein, even though they will respond very well to it. So there's, there's more research to be done there. Actually, Scott from Finger Lakes Feeder sent me a paper on that that I, I want to have an opportunity to read. I haven't read yet, but I talked in part about how uh, protein needs for isopods are probably exaggerated. But in general, the ones that will really go after the protein are most of the larger Porcelio, actually most of the Porcelio in general, Porcelio and Desprunosus. Um, those tend to be the really protein, the ones that are super interested in protein are right there. And then, uh, let's see. If I miss a super chat or something, can somebody tell me? Because I want to make sure I don't. But I, it's hard to keep track. So, um, and I would say, yeah, most of the Porcelias, try giving them 
more and see how they react to it. But in general, uh, if you give them enough food, they will generally be okay, but a lot of them will really go after the protein. So, uh, hopefully that helps. So, Beatrice has two questions. When you moisten the bins for isobuds, how much water do you put in it? I think I might be too careful and barely two-thirds is drier instead of 50-50. Um, that's not too bad. Oh, it is about time to cut down. Uh, thank you, Sean, for letting me know. I'll make sure I'll get through all the Patreon questions, then I'll have to wrap up. So, um, Beatrice, it depends on your isopods. It depends on the size of your enclosure. It depends on the depth of your substrate, moss that you use, whether you use moss or not, how much moss you use, um, your own ambient temperature, airflow, and the particular ventilation you have on your enclosure. So there's not a magic uh, number that I can tell you, like, like a quantity, like 50 cubic uh, centimeters or whatever. I can't, can't tell you exactly how much water to put in your enclosure, but I can say that if you, your enclosure is two-thirds as drier instead of 50-50, a lot of them are going to be okay. And 50-50 is not a necessarily a magic number depending on what we're working with. Um, there are plenty that will do well with 50-50, some will do well with 25-75, so, you know, 36, 33, what is it? 33, 66, that's, you know, so it can change a lot. Um, just, the most important thing is making sure that there's a place where they can all reach, they can all hydrate, and a place where they can get away from that, um, that higher moisture. So, hopefully that helps. And also, second question, how would you recommend transporting by car sensitive species like Cubara species rubber ducky to have them survive a day long driving trip? Well, depending on the temperature, I would either get a heat pack or a cool pack, and I would definitely get a cooler, put them in the cooler, make sure that they're, they're tight in the cooler. In other words, they're packed with some loose packing material that makes it so they don't jiggle about in that cooler. And then, you know, if it's warmer, I'd put a cool pack in there, an ice pack, not necessarily right against their enclosure, but in there so that it helps keep them cool and if it's uh, cold outside I put a heat pack in the enclosure too and I'm uh, not in the enclosure but in the in the cooler and use that insulation of the cooler to help protect them and then if you are getting out of the car and leaving the car any place where it's going to get really cold or really hot when you're out of the car take them with you if you're getting out of the car for 30 seconds probably not a big deal if you're getting out of the car for five minutes at least where I live in the summer you could kill your ice pods if you left them in there so um, take them with you wherever you're going for any length of time. And I think you can do fine with them. So Radka wants to know about any badly breeding but still display isopods. For those of us who don't have space, can't divide isopod colonies all the time. I'd like to get a few colonies from my work desk, but that is about all the space I can offer. Cubaris or Armadillidium species preferred. I would say one thing you could do is get um, something like Armadillidium granulatum, or not granulatum, um, Armadillidium gestroy, and then just decrease the leaf litter you give them so they don't get a ton of leaf litter, and then make sure they get good quality supplemental food. And their, their breeding should slow down quite a bit, but their survivability should stay fine. They should do really well for you as far as health-wise, but they should not breed as much. Of course, it depends on the quality of the supplemental food. If it's got like powdered leaves or things like that in there, that might boost their breeding too. But I, I keep a fairly small colony of Armadillium gestroy in a display enclosure. And I just, I do have to remove them once in a while, put them somewhere else, but it's not nearly as bad as it would be with, say, dairy cows. And Dan, Dan Berard, what's your current wish, wish list isopods? I want some orange Werner eye. Um, I would love, let's see, some more um, yellow zebras, but I guess you're talking about species that I don't have. I don't have orange Werner eye. I don't have orange Kluge eye. I actually would really like those now that I've been reminded that they're around. Um, there's some Cubaris I don't have. I would love some Marulanellas of various types that I don't have any Marulanellas. Um, and I don't have Bolivari, Porcelio Bolivari, I don't have at all. Uh, so that's another one. I'm trying to think of what else. Actually, the Big Pine Keys ones that uh, Kyle at Roach Crossing has. And I'm, I'm throwing everything out there just like what I would like without regard to any other considerations. Um, those are you know, some types that I would like. And a morning gecko question. Do you find it difficult to keep up with the population? Been debating getting some, but hesitant about removing, raising eggs, and increasing population. I haven't had a big problem for a couple of reasons. One is because if I miss babies, the adults tend to catch them and eat them. So um, 
sometimes that has happened. I always try to get the babies out before the parents get to them, but the parents will eat them. Um, and then that's a, you know, they're gone, so I don't have to worry about the population. But that, I always want to try to save as many as I can because it's easy to sell them. I feel like they're super easy to sell, so I haven't had a problem. I have, let me put some Supreme Isopod chow in there for them. I'm going to go to town on that. Um, yeah, I guess that's what I would say, is that uh, I have never had issues with trying to get rid of them. Sometimes I, I'm thinking like, oh, this thing, the juvenile enclosure, the grout enclosure is getting a little full. And then I list some, and then they're gone. I sell off six, and I'm, I'm good. That kind of stuff. So hopefully that helps. All right. So I'm trying to see if I missed other questions. I probably missed some, but I do have to close up because I don't want to encroach on other uh, live streams too much. So I really appreciate everybody coming in. I appreciate the super chats. It's been awesome. And you have been awesome. I'm going to be at the Wasatch Reptile Expo this Saturday. So if you're in the Salt Lake City, Utah area, and you would like to come see me, come say hi. I'm going to have an educational slash vendor table. It's going to be both. So um, part of my reason for being there is just to, to hang out, chat with people, teach some people some new things hopefully they didn't know. And uh, I hope to see those of you who are in the area or can make it into the area at the expo. We'd love to, to say hi, chat with you, um, and things like that. And I also have some really cool news about what I will be vending there, and that's going to be coming up in a video soon. So I'll save that for the next video uh, that should be coming out on Friday if everything works out well. But uh, I really appreciate everybody being here. I hope you all stay healthy and stay safe. And I'll see you next time.